Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending this month's webinar presented by Dr. Nora Coleman and Dr. Karen Heber on SAFE, a debriefing tool to identify latent conditions in pre-construction design simulation testing. I am Pavan Zaveri, a member of the IPSS Education Committee. For those of you who are not IPSS members, please consider joining the Society as we offer many benefits to our members, including exclusive access to this recorded webinar and presentation after today's live session. Please look, visit our website, ipssglobal.org, to see the benefits of membership. A few quick housekeeping notes before we get to today's presentation. Feel, please feel free to post questions during the session. In the upper right side of your computer screen, you will see a control panel. In the lower portion of that panel, you can type in a question or comment and submit it to the webinar organizers. You can do this at any time during the presentation. We will reserve about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A, where I will read the questions and we'll have Dr. Coleman and Dr. Heber answer those questions. As I mentioned, Dr. Coleman and Dr. Heber will be discussing SAFE, a debriefing tool to identify latent conditions in pre-construction design simulation testing. The session will conclude with an open question and answer period. Nora is an assistant professor in pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Her research focuses on the delivery of quality and patient safety focused simulation. She has extensive experience in leading system-wide initiatives where simulation has been used as a vehicle to meet system-wide quality goals. She is also passionate about the role of simulation as a means to proactively identify latent safety threats in new healthcare design. Her strong clinical background coupled with simulation and patient safety experience allows her to impact patient care in multiple facets. Karen has a broad background in critical care medicine and is currently the medical director of the Children's Simulation Center. He has formal training in quality and patient safety. He is a member of the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society and the Society for Simulation and Healthcare Resiliency, Safety 3 group. In addition, Karen has successfully administered projects in staffing, research protections, and budgets, as well as collaborated with other researchers and produced several peer-reviewed publications. He has experience in simulation-based hospital design testing and areas of expertise in simulation, adult learning, and improvement science. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Nora and Karen to present this their webinar, um, which was one of the IPSSV 2020 award winners as an oral presentation. Nora? Thank you for introducing me and for having me here to um, talk about safety briefing and our approach to hospital design testing. Just close this. All right. So this um, picture may resonate with um, a lot of you, and it's certainly what Atlanta looks like these days. Um, despite COVID, there seems to be a lot of pits of construction as um, a lot of new healthcare facilities are being built, and that is no exception to the rule here at Children's. Um, so in the past sev several years, there has been a major boom in the rates of hospital construction, and that's really been to replace aging facilities and support population shifts and accommodate new and advancing healthcare technologies. Annual investments in healthcare are um, around $40 billion and only expected to rise above that um, beyond 2022. And as a result, healthcare systems are really urged to build safer, more efficient facilities. Um, and in order to do that, we need to better understand the complex interactions between people and their environment uh, that contribute to patient safety and quality. And so safe is just safety briefing is a part of that. And I'll walk you a little bit through um, simulation-based hospital design testing and the project we've done, and then really get into the weeds of um, safety briefing. 
today I'm really going to focus on hospital design testing, which falls on the very early phase of architectural planning for a new healthcare environment. But I really wanted to present the role of simulation on a continuum. Um, it just doesn't play a role in pre-construction or the extreme ends of hospital design planning being pre-construction and post-construction testing, but really can fall um, along the time course of any facility design project. So simulation hospital design testing focuses on evaluating latent conditions in the built environment, specifically around the architectural design um, during design development. Uh, we, recently, if you follow me on Twitter, we did um, simulation-based design prototype testing. Um, and this was really to validate the final architectural design and our concrete is already being poured and structures are going up at this point. It also allowed us to test some um, design elements that we couldn't do in the warehouse, like boom placement, medical equipment planning. Um, simulation can also be used once your concrete is poured or your building is even constructed as part of transition planning or pre-occupancy evaluation. And this we refer to as simulation-based clinical systems testing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the differences between systems-based testing and hospital design testing. And then of course, simulation can also be used as part of a post-occupancy evaluation and long beyond your project time Line is completed, there's always a need for ongoing process improvement and the, a lot of the things in our approach to um, design and clinical systems testing can also be used later on post-construction or even in an already um, existing uh, clinical environment. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, SEEPS 2.0 as this uh, framework really anchors a lot of the work we do. Um, so the SEEPS model provides a framework to characterize system interaction so that we can efficiently identify system flaws and uh, key opportunities for improvement. So this framework identifies five components. The environment is what we're gonna talk a lot about today. Um, it also looks at technology, tasks, people, and organization. And in this framework, work system elements impact care process and that impacts healthcare outcomes. Often in healthcare, um, if you think about how we do root cause analysis, we start with the healthcare outcome. We start with an error or a near miss or an adverse event that happened. And we work um, in a reactive way backwards. And a lot of the times our analysis focus on gaps in the system or gaps specifically related to care process. And sometimes we get all the way back down to the work system element to identify flaws in either tasks or a piece of technology that, work, that didn't uh, work well. Um, we really don't focus too much on the built environment because for most of us, we're not working in a pre-constructed environment. We are working in a built environment that has sometimes been around for decades. Um, and clinicians have to work around those limitations in the environment. So we can't move walls or move where our sinks are located or where our walls or angles are our doors. Um, and so we often don't even think about how those elements in the environment impact our ability to deliver care because we're just focusing on taking care of the patient and we're gonna create workarounds to um, mitigate the issues that our environment has placed before us. Um, so hospital design testing works in the opposite direction. Like I said, it works in a reactive um, approach to design development. Um, and here we focus solely in on the built environment as a means to impact outcome. Um, and especially um, simulation-based hospital design testing is important because in this phase of testing, we have the ability to move walls, completely redesign care team stations or the layout of an operative area. Um, and once you pour all of these in concrete, it's of course much harder to take down walls or re-angle corridors and is often even cost prohibitive um, if you do the testing too late. The other thing about healthcare, as you all know, is it's a complex adaptive system. So uh, that means that each of these elements work in complex and dynamic ways. Um, and if, one, if you change one thing in your work system environment, that's going to have subsequent downstream effects. Um, and so there is a lot of variability in care delivery. And we realized just how much variability within our microsystem we had as we went through design testing. Um, standardized design is not always gonna equate to standardized practice. So just because you create a standard room doesn't mean we cannulate to ECMO the same across the cardiac ICU, PICU, and NICU. Um, but you really wanna create an environment that doesn't add to that complexity that already exists in healthcare delivery. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between clinical systems testing and hospital design testing. So in clinical systems testing, uh, the goal is to identify gaps in the work system and in process. And this is usually employed in a functioning healthcare space or a healthcare space that is completely constructed and just opening um, for patient care. And this uh, type of testing um, identifies these gaps in the work system to help with operational readiness and can even ease transitioning of teams into their new space. Um, during simulations, care process are fully implemented um, so that you can identify process or issues in all elements of the system. But in hospital design testing, this is often happening at least five to seven years prior to the facility opening. And the work system at that time point is incomplete. Things like tools, technology, staffing models, and especially care process are far from being developed and even difficult um, to imagine. So um, the the approaches that we use in clinical systems testing can't apply to design testing um, because the work system isn't yet to even exist. Um, so like I've mentioned already, hospital design testing puts an exclusive focus on the physical environment to identify latent conditions that directly relate to architectural design. Um, and the other thing I already mentioned is clinicians don't really think about their um, environment. And we often cr create workarounds that we don't even recognize exist. Um, and so while simulation-based clinical systems testing asks ask clinicians to think about solutions to remedy process deficiencies, we really need to rely on architects during hospital design testing to devise alternatives and solutions. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of these other differences as we go through the talk today. So just to orient you to our project, to give you some perspective on um, what we were doing. So in preparation for our new freestanding children's hospital, we conducted um, simulation-based hospital design testing, and we evaluated both the schematic and detailed design um, in a full scale in a full scale cardboard mock-up. And we looked at 11 distinct clinical areas, and this was all done in the pre-construction phase of planning. This gave our clinicians um, ability to interact with their, with their environment. They were able to provide the architect team with feedback. They could evaluate the impact of design decisions, test design alternatives, and test functionality and limitations of the environment for both routine and infrequent high-risk clinical scenarios. Um, and like I said, once you um, make poor concrete, any retrofitting in the environment is extremely costly and even cost prohibitive. And so that's why we wanted to do this work early enough in the design process where we could make major, major architectural modifications um, that was um, even not just cost prohibitive, but could potentially save our system money in the long run. So this is just a, um, a bird's eye view of our cardboard city. We conducted simulations in two rounds of testing. In between rounds of testing, modifications were made to either the schematic or detailed design, and those modifications were designed and devised by our, our architect team. Um, those changes were then reflected in the mock-up, and we brought our teams back for a second round of testing. In the second round of testing, we uh, conducted the same exact scenarios with the same degree of fidelity in order to test and validate those design modifications. Um, and the fidelity of the mock-up remained consistent between rounds of testing. Um, we identified each latent condition and used FMEA to score each latent condition, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. Um, and then our teams actually rescored in round two, they rescored the latent conditions we identified in round one to determine if we actually mitigated risk or if we created more problems down the line. You'll hear me talk a lot about schematic versus detailed design. Um, so I just wanted to kind of orient you to the differences in design development. So um, during schematic design testing, we're really looking at the overall layout of the space. So we mocked up representations of our inpatient unit. So our ICUs, general care areas, our emergency department, uh, which included triage, our exam rooms, um, and the trauma bay. Um, we also mocked up the PACU, uh, the OR space, the um, day, our day surgery areas. And so we're in this phase of testing, we're looking at adjacencies and orientation of support structures. So things like your medication room, your clean supply, nutrition room, equipment rooms, um, soiled utility, how do people and equipment 
um, move through the space and what is workflow like in the space. Um, we looked at um, efficiency, staff fatigue, does overall layout impact teamwork and communication? And I'll, work, I'll walk you through some, uh, some specific examples um, as we get into SAFE. In detail design, that's where we get inside the room. So we start to get into the ICU room, into the trauma bay, into the actual OR. We look at room layout and configuration, and we spent a lot of time looking at mounted equipment or um, things that are fixed to the walls. So we looked at things like documentation stations, medical gases, how many air oxygen did you need and in what distribution do you need them and in what height do you need them? Um, things that clinicians often just work around and don't really think about. We looked at where are your sharps containers, where are your countertops, where are you prepping your medications, where is your sink and your paper towel dispensers and your soap. We actually found that all of our soap dispensers in the entire bed tower, which is about 400 beds, was just going right into the um, sink. So um, a small change, but when you're talking about 400 rooms, um, that has a big impact down the line if all of those elements need to be moved um, after construction. Um, so in the planning of any new healthcare facility, uh, there is a practical need to imagine how work would be done. Um, but work, th that would be work is imagined, obviously. Um, but it, as Eric Hallnagel says, it is impossible to, in practice as well as in principle precisely to prescribe how work is done. Um, and so work is done really reflects actual care delivery and your realities of the work system. Um, when we first got into doing our um, planning uh, and deciding kind of on the size and shape of our ICU rooms, we mocked up just the space with some tape um, to identify how big our rooms were going to be. We shoved a bunch of equipment in and everybody said, great, all the equipment fits. Um, and then when we actually got in there to do simulation, the equipment fit, but it's one thing to fit and it's another thing to move. And it's another thing when you put people into the room and then you attach your patient to a ventilator and booms and um, to all of their IV poles. So I just wanted to share this video with you all. Um, it probably has uh, one of my most hits on Twitter, um, but it is um, demonstrates that work as we imagined, like we thought this room was gonna be great, big enough to do ECMO cannulation, not a problem. And then this video just highlight, highlights the cognitive load on the team and complexity of care delivery that really couldn't be imagined when we were doing uh, design planning around a tabletop. So um, I'd like to say this doesn't happen in real life, but in the reality, it actually does, right? And I'm sure a lot of you can um, imagine all of these complexities in care delivery and how difficult it is for clinicians to kind of sit around a table and explain to an architect, this is how complex it is to transition a patient just from a crib into a bed to cannulate to ECMO. Um, so simulation is um, really effective in promoting that collaboration between architects and clinicians, and it helps level the perception in work as imagined and by architects and the work as actually done by clinicians. So our methodology integrates um, three components, evidence-based design, and I'm gonna spend some time defining what that means. Um, simulation, of course, and debriefing, and failure mode and effect analysis, and we'll kind of walk through each of these pieces. So we, I've kind of alluded to some of these things already, but I wanted to take 
a moment here and just talk about why we uh, develop SAFE and the rationale for creating a new approach to debriefing. So like I mentioned before, this testing is often done five to seven years before your facility actually opens and your work system is incomplete and difficult to imagine. Um, and so that makes it difficult to translate that clinical systems testing approach to hospital design. Um, and we really are focusing in on the physical space. Um, we integrate evidence-based design into our approach here. And evidence-based design is rigorous research that links the physical environment to healthcare outcomes. It is applied by architects in order to build healthcare spaces that better support safe care and can reduce healthcare associated conditions. The other thing that makes hospital design testing different is that it requires very direct facilitation that really prompts participants to interact with the design features that are under question. And I'm gonna talk a lot about how we directly facilitate simulations. Um, and, what, and where I've already alluded to is we have had a lot of our clinicians have done education-based simulation. Our centers and our teams are used to doing SIM. Some of them had even done pre-occupancy clinical systems testing, but none of our clinicians had really done hospital design testing. And so they are really unfamiliar with that evidence-based design or those principles that impact healthcare outcomes. Um, and when you're de debriefing systems testing, you're really building on the bedside experiences and knowledge and perceptions to uncover those system inefficiencies and for your teams to come up with potential solutions. But due to the knowledge gap that our clinicians have in um, experience with architecture and design, they weren't really equipped to, divine, to devise design alternatives, um, especially because our teams don't really understand building code and regulations, all the structural requirements, um, things like electrical and data infrastructure. Uh, therefore, really having our architects integral and part of this process is uh, essential to its success. And what SAFE does is it harnesses the clinical expertise from frontline staff and your healthcare teams and translates that into information that architects can use to create and devise design alternatives that better meet, um, address safety concerns and meet the needs of the clinicians. So SAFE was developed over about a one year period. Um, it is conceptually rooted in evidence-based design. And then of course it's intermixed with fundamental simulation theory, things like establishing psychological safety, confidentiality, debriefing without judgment and exploring the participant frame of thinking. Um, it was a multi-step process and involved um, a pretty in-depth review of the healthcare architectural literature and evidence-based safe design principles. Um, and what I would say about evidence-based design is the framework that exists out there that's been um, suggested and created by AHRQ and the Center for Health Design is actually focused on post-construction evaluation. So there's a post-occupancy safety risk assessment toolkit that's actually accessible on the Center for Health Design's website. Um, but these principles are not geared towards pre-construction. So we actually needed to take the information that's out there and adapt it to the pre-constructed warehouse environment um, because there are things like flooring, lighting, noise reduction, um, some pieces of visibility that can't be done in a cardboard or evaluated in a cardboard mock-up. The other thing that was really important for us is there's nothing out there for pediatrics. So while um, all of the frameworks that have been developed by HRQ and CHD exist and are were a great resource to kind of get us started, um, they really don't necessarily look at um, the con special considerations for pediatrics. And so we, we needed to create a framework that not only allowed us to um, thoroughly evaluate the pre-constructed environment, but also um, adapt to some of our, some of the things that are really specific to pediatric care delivery. Um, as part of developing SAFE, we spent a lot of time creating detailed facilitator guides that allowed us to anchor these SAFE design principles, and I'll walk you through some examples of what those are, um, to the clinical context. And um, this went, underwent multiple iterative revisions, um, to form this succinct debriefing approach. And we actually applied safety briefing in four rounds of testing. So the two rounds of schematic design, two rounds of detailed design. And since, um, as we've done some higher fidelity um, based simulations, we've applied safe to those um, testing, to that testing as well. Um, so like I've mentioned, evidence-based design is, um, 
has principles that allow us to link the environment to healthcare outcomes. Um, and so things like minimizing envir environmental hazards, improving visibility, looking at how your um, layout impacts staff fatigue, looking to reduce risk of injury, so sharp corners, things that would make people slip, trip, or fall, protecting privacy, um, looking at eliminate sor eliminating sources of infection. And when these principles are not fit effectively employed during design development or design planning, there's the potential for a failure um, to exist when, com when combined with these latent conditions. So the latent condition is the accident waiting to, to happen, um, and the active failure uh, is the what happens or the error that happens at the level of the frontline operator that's felt um, felt almost immediately. Um, so, for example, if I'm sure many of you might even be able to imagine something like standardization. So, in our current hospital, our equipment and su emergency supplies are not standardized across all areas. So, when our ICU teams go out to a rapid response. Um, or code blue on the floor, then they have to look for the emergency bag mask and it's in a different location every single time. So this increases search and locate actions and increases the cognitive load on our team. So um, standardization would be the evidence-based design principle and lack of standardization would be the latent condition. And then the potential active failure would be increased cognitive load or even a delay in patient care. So by grounding hospital design testing in evidence-based design, we were able to identify uh, a wide range of latent conditions and inefficiencies in design. And we created the scenarios with these pre-identified principles in mind, and then linked each task in the scenario to a design feature. So just to summarize, if you're looking to um, do de design testing and anchor it to evidence-based design, you actually want to start with the design elements that are being evaluated and what evidence-based design principles you're looking to assess. You then want to kind of take a step backwards and create the clinical context by which you can evaluate those design elements. And then once you've created all of your scenarios, you want to make sure that you um, take a look back at your evidence-based design and all of the latent conditions um, and design features that could be impacted in that space and make sure that you've got a wide range of latent conditions um, across all of the scenarios that you're conducting. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about facilitation. I'm just keeping an eye on my timer so I don't run out of time. Um, so we uh, conducted very focused facilitation during this type of testing. And you really need your um, clinicians to interact with specific design features because remember, this is not a space that's well known to them. So they're not going to know like, where is the med room? Where is the respiratory room? Where is my gas located? Am I supposed to even interact with that stuff? Um, am I supposed to wash my hands? And so you really need to do almost like um, a director would tell actors how to move through a movie. Um, that's how we did facilitated these types of simulations. So you're not really relying at all on team member decision making and the facilitators are queuing each task in the scenario um, and prompting performance of those tasks to meet those predetermined testing objectives. And you don't need to really adapt your scenario content to the level of your learner either because you're telling them exactly what to do. And I'm, I'm going to talk about pre-briefing um, in the next slide. But for example, um, if we were completing intubation, then the facilitator would tell the nurses, okay, go get medications from, um, go get medications from uh, the medication room, or they would tell the respiratory therapist, get a ventilator from the equipment room or intubating supplies from your clean supply room. Um, where applicable, we gave our teams autonomy to do things to implement the care process as they wanted to. So as long as they went to the medication room, I didn't really you know, spend too much time talking about how they labeled their medication or how they did their independent double check. I just needed them to go and experience where the medication room was and how that impacted their workflow and their efficiency. Um, and so we gave them some autonomy and process because process really wasn't at all what we were looking at. And so we didn't need to direct that piece of the clinical scenario. Focusing on the built environment also just helps shift that focus away from medical management. So here are some scripts. This is um, what we actually use during simulation testing. So you can see kind of just to anchor you to where we are, all the way on the left-hand side is our vital signs and our facilitator cues for our mannequins. And then in the center is all of our facilitator cues. So 
um, exactly what we wanted the teams to do, what kind of equipment we wanted them um, to retrieve and where we wanted to retrieve that from. And then on the right-hand side is our um, evidence-based to safe design principle. And then all of the things that we would do to um, evaluate that principle. So if we were looking at safety, for example, where exactly is your Sharps container? Um, where is your med, zo med zone for drawing up medications? Um, if we were looking at infection control, could you get to your PPE, your glove boxes, um, uh, your, your masks and things like that? And here's just another example. Um, we looked at fixture and equipment. Um, so where is your oxygen? Where is your suction? Um, where is your uh, medical gases and how are they oriented uh, along the wall and can you can the teams reach them um, or are they in the wrong orientation? We actually did find a few places where our uh, medical air and gas were actually um, oriented um, kind of in the incorrect orientation and relationship to each other. Um, and SAFE really provides a framework also so that your clinical team can start to see their care and process through a lens that links architectural design to safety. And I have one more video here to share. Nora, feel free to speak over the video as I think the audio is not coming through. Oh, sorry. I guess it sounds like y'all can't hear the audio on the video. Apologize about that. Um, so the teams were just looking through, um, looking at workflow through the space, how the surgical team um, moves. Is there a pathway for the OR tables to get through? Is there enough clearance around the head of the bed for the long ECMO wires? Um, and so really starting to look at their environment and not necessarily the process of cannulating to ECMO, but do they have space and do the room, do the booms accommodate flexibility to turn the head of the bed and meet variating, a variation in patient care needs. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the pre-brief. Um, so we allotted about 45 minutes for pre-briefing in order to review ob objectives for testing. Um, and we did spend time differentiating between hospital design testing and other types of simulation so our teams could start to get oriented to what we were doing. When you're doing this type of work, it's really important to discuss upfront any design changes that are not modifiable at the point of testing. So for us, things like square footage of the space, the room sizes, the shape of the room, the stacking plan, um, the number of beds, things like elevators and stairwells were already fixed. Um, any major changes to the environment that are gonna be a big deal for your teams, it's really important for them to know that going into simulation, otherwise the debriefing can really be derailed. So for us, our, um, our current NICU and CI are actually open bay units. And before we did testing, our hospital system decided that we were going to um, single patient rooms for those areas. Um, that's not something you want your clinical frontline staff to learn in simulation because you don't want your debriefing to be, that's a big, big transition for our staff and you don't want um, simulation and testing to get um, sidetracked by talking about major changes that actually aren't gonna be modifiable. Um, of course, this is a vulnerable process for people that have been spending a lot of time um, do, working on the planning phases. Um, and so you wanna, you want to reiterate that this is not to discredit that type of the work that has already been done, but just to um, revise and optimize the design so that it's um, the safest for, sorry, for our patients. Um, so uh, we also reviewed the design elements that were going to be uh, included in the mock-up. So for us, we walked the teams through uh, what, what was included. So I uh, told them we were gonna be looking at like medication room, clean supply rooms, or during detailed design, we told them, okay, you you're gonna look at your nurse server, you're gonna look at your sinks, and this way you could start to orient them um, and get them to think about um, what they were gonna be evaluating before they even started um, the scenario. Um, we uh, introduced the architect team. So our architect team introduced themselves um, and that really also enforced collaboration so that our teams felt 
open to provide feedback um, and it engaged our architect team and gave them an opportunity to establish a relationship with frontline cl clinicians that weren't necessarily at the table during design development um, meetings. Uh, we told our teams that to suspend their disbelief um, and that we would be directly facilitating their interactions with certain design features. Um, and again, like this also, we. We also told them ahead of time, like, we'll help guide you through the warehouse because a lot of them were nervous, like, I don't know where the med room is and I don't know where my equipment room is. This was the first time many of our frontline staff had actually seen the designs. Um, and so we did have um, part of our SIM team and staff kind of in the mock-up so we could tell, show people, okay, here's where your equipment room is or your med supply room is, you know, down the hallway to the right. And so um, it helped ease some of the anxiety uh, for staff as well. Um, okay, hit everything. Um, I wanted to take a second to talk about the debrief team. So this also looks a little bit different than your traditional education-based simulation. So your debriefing team is made up of two groups. So your inner circle is your frontline staff. Those are the participants. And then your outer circle actually makes up your observer group. So your participants are your physicians, nurses, therapists, and technicians. They represent their professional role and they conduct care during simulation. Um, and then your observers are your unit base and system leaders. Um, and in order to bring forth the realities of work as actually done, we elicited feedback from the frontline staff first, and then we move outward toward unit and system leaders, and then lastly, the architects. And the benefit of having unit and system leaders at the debriefing is they can kind of speak to what's best practice. We identified that a lot of times it, we were, our clinical teams were not necessarily doing best practice um, in our current hospital setting. And so they reiterated things like, okay, we're creating medication safety room, we're creating a medication rooms because we want you to actually do an independent double check in a safe med zone. Um, and so they can um, speak to some of the best practices and maybe why there were certain design elements that were um, devised or that they were thinking about doing. And then the team could say, okay, well, if I'm gonna use the medication room, it has to be in a space where it's efficient for my workflow or where I have visibility. And then lastly, we elicited feedback from the architect team um, so that they could ask questions to better understand the perspective of the frontline staff um, and to also ask preferences. So sometimes they would ask them things like, do you wanna pass through? Do you like glass? Do you not like glass? Um, so SAFE is a five-step guide. Um, and we, for each phase of the clinical scenario, we uh, use these five steps repeatedly. Sorry, we allot about 45 um, to 60 minutes for each debrief. Um, and so I'm gonna walk you through um, each of the five steps. So the first step is um, summarize. So where the facilitator reviews um, the goals of testing and then um, reviews the scenario that the team completed. A is anchor the clinical context. So here the facilitator orients each team uh, or the team to each phase of care within the scenario in a chronologic order. F is facilitate identification of the latent condition. And here the facilitator asks questions related to those evidence-based design principles. E is explore the potential active failure. So the facilitator really elicits the impact of those latent conditions from the frontline team's perspective. And E is the second E is elicit additional feedback. So the facilitator elicits feedback um, from the architects. And it was really important um, for these descriptions to be explicit. So Kieran did a lot of the debriefing and obviously he knows the impact of like not doing an independent double check during med safety or during med administration, but uh, we really had to have the clinicians explain out loud, especially with the architects being there, okay, what happens when you don't do an independent double check or what happens when you don't have a med zone that's protected and what is the impact, the downstream impact of those safe practices not being employed effectively. Um, so even if the rationale for a latent condition or potential active failure seemed overly obvious to the staff, um, we really had them um, be explicit and explain and walk through those potential active failures. 
Um, and I just want to note, we did this as interval debriefing as opposed to a cumulative final debriefing. So we did three scenarios. And after each scenario, we conducted a safety briefing to walk the team in chronicle chronologic order through the entire scenario. And then we would go back and do the second scenario and debrief. Um, so just to give you an example of what um, safety briefing look like. So if the patient was apneic and required intub intubation, then um, the facilitator would say, okay, the respiratory therapist and identify who the respiratory therapists were that participated in the scenario. You went to the respiratory equipment room to retrieve the ventilator for intubation. So here we anchored the clinical context. Um, and then the facilitator may ask, did the distance from the equipment and supply room in relation to workspace cause any excessive walking? They might then, to explore an active failure, say, how did the location of the medication room and respiratory equipment room impact staff workflow efficiency? And will this location of these spaces and orientation lead to any unsafe workarounds? And then the architects might ask the team, do you require or do you prefer that the equipment room has a pass-through so that it could be accessed from both sides of the hallway or is one door okay? Um, just a, a few latent conditions that we identified um, during simulation. So, and one of our patients had a seizure and they needed to be um, intubated. So we looked at visibility. We looked at visibility from the medication rooms into the patient room, from the collaboration space, from the nursing alcove. Um, as a latent condition related to visit visibility, which was the evidence-based design principle, the teams identified that when they sat down at the nursing alcove, they couldn't see to the head of the bed inside the room. And that was because the built encounters inside of the room blocked the sight line to the patient. Um, and so a potential active failure was that if you couldn't see your patient from your alcove, that if you miss clinical change in clinical status or change in vital signs, there would be a delay in patient care that could be detrimental to the patient. So from there, the architectural design modification um, was that the nursing alcove was actually redesigned. So in 400 plus rooms, um, each alcove was raised to standing height so that there, there could be visibility to the head of the patient bed. Um, when we looked at um, providing safe care or providing efficient care, um, there was concern that in the medication room, there wasn't a window. And so teams felt like they couldn't safely do an independent double check because they couldn't see into the hallway to actually find a nurse to do at, to be the second person to do the double check. So the um, potential active failure was that staff would actually create a workaround and maybe not even do an independent double check at all if they couldn't see out into the hallway and kind of wave a second person down to help them do their safe med medication administration and preparation practices. So one of the architectural modifications was that the door to the medication room was redesigned and a large glass window was added to improve sight lines so that staff could um, have an easier time finding um, a second person to do independent double check. And then minimizing staff fatigue. So for us, this, this um, issue is actually a fairly big one, especially for the ICU. So the respiratory equipment room was small and the layout and how it was oriented in relation to the supply room were really far away from each other. Um, and our um, shape of our hospital is too long, like how hallways, it's an L shape and it's a racetrack. Um, and so you could only get to the respiratory equipment room from one side of the hallway. So if you had a patient in room, 12 that needed a vent, you'd have to walk all the way down the hallway, all the way across and down the other side to access the equipment room. And so the potential failure was that you couldn't store enough um, ventilators that were calibrated. You could damage equipment pulling, that, pulling them out of a small room. It was too far from the supply room or from the patient room when you had to walk in circles around the unit, and that would lead to workflow inefficiency and staff fatigue and could potentially delay care if you couldn't access vents quickly. And so we actually relocated the supply and equipment rooms to be co-located next to each other. The respiratory equipment room was made larger, and then a pass-through was created so that it could be accessible from both sides of the hallway. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this because I wanna leave time for questions, um, but we use failure mode and effect analysis to score and categorize, categorize each latent condition so that the architects could really prioritize devi devising design alternatives 
for the latent conditions with the highest risk of patient safety. Um, we did identify a reduction in criticality score during hospital design testing um, and did were able to was able to mitigate risk through design modifications. And I've kind of talked about some of the changes um, that we made during hospital design testing. Um, and ooh, just lastly, um, this is some just preliminary data, but um, we estimate that we saved our hospital between 60 to $80 million um, in cost avoidance and cost savings. Um, and I just wanna summarize um, by saying, um, SAFE really took feedback from our healthcare teams and translated it into an evidence-based design context that could really be used by architects to inform design changes to make um, modifications that address safety concern. It also really helped us bridge that gap between work is imagined and work is done. And SAFE um, really mirrors things like common usability testing um, and um, human factor ergonomics and user-centered design, which often is not used in healthcare, but is used in other industries where um, end users get to evaluate and interact with the prototype being tested. Um, and this gave us information necessary for cycles of iterative redesign evaluation um, so that we can make our space safer and more efficient for um, hopefully our patients in the future. And I'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Nora. That was truly a wonderful and informative presentation. Um, we do have a bit of time for questions and that Nora and Karen, who's made himself available post-call to address. So um, if you guys have any questions, please do put them in the question box and we can have uh, Nora and Karen address them. Uh, in the meanwhile, as you're thinking about this, about your questions, I do want to remind folks that uh, the IPSS Spring Symposium is coming up in just about six weeks. Um, and one of the, the two, the theme is simulation transforming safety. And the two main topics that we're going to cover are um, safety two and resilience with a keynote speaker followed by several workshop style discussions. And the second topic is actually going to be applying design thinking to the systems testing as uh, Nora and Karen have been doing a great job at and great work at, but applying, uh, having a, a keynote speaker and then several breakout workshops um, on applying some of the elements of design thinking to design testing. And so uh, definitely look forward to people joining there. Um, so I see one comment in the question box and I'm just gonna read it out because it is great. Congratulations on a fantastic body of work. This should be the exemplar for all of healthcare construction and that comes from Lennox Wong. Uh, so I appreciate that comment, Lennox. Uh, definitely do agree that your uh, work has really just taken things to a different level. Um, and so one question that I had uh, was, how did you guys insert yourself into the construction design process? I think um, Kieran can speak to this as well, but uh, other centers had already laid the groundwork to doing some of this type of work. So Texas Children's and Cincinnati and um, um, out on the West Coast in Seattle also. So we really had built off of their work also, but saw this as an opportunity for us to really impact patient safety in a meaningful way and do it at a time course where it would save everybody talks money right so it'd be a safety um, evaluation tool and potentially a cost savings tool and so really engaging hospital leadership very early on and kieran did most of that front work and i i'll let him kind of speak to that as well yeah no uh thanks Pavan, for the question um I think that's the big challenge, right? And so uh, we really used the systems testing work that we had done for new facilities that we had opened and to demonstrate our competence as a team. And then I approached the chief nursing officer and the operating officer to say, listen, we've got a great opportunity here to, to have the frontline workers build a hospital. And truthfully, I think um, we had a little bit of luck because I'm not sure that there was a full comprehension of what I was proposing and how how we were gonna integrate and try to look at some human factors pieces. 
but there was enough trust there to say, okay, we'll do it. And, um, and now that we've got the return on investment fiscally, it kind of across the board brings about a lot of holistically, everybody's kind of happy with, with what was done, so to speak. The, the big piece I would say at the end is, are the changes that you identified really going to be adopted and do they fit into the overall construction budget? And that is a, that's a piece that's highly variable amongst institutions. But it's one where when you come here with some objective data, you do have a lot more ground to go, go and push to get some of these things that, that you feel may be um, well. Did we lose him? <laughs> yeah, losing I think the, the other question that we often get um, as we present this work is, okay, well, you're doing this five years before you actually design a hospital. And with the rates of staff turnover, which I think across the country are pretty high and for us, like as high as sometimes 60% in a year, we have staff turnover, at least in our PICU. Like, okay, so if you if the staff in five, five years before say, I like this, I don't like this, you make all these changes, spend all this money, do all this design modification. How do you know that when you get into the new hospital, the new staff is going to like what the old staff decide? And that's another reason to do this work and link it to an infrastructure and um, evidence-based design. It's not, it's not about likes and dislikes, it's about safety. And so I think that as we did this type of work and built that momentum, it's not asking, oh, I don't like the color of the walls and I don't like where this is. This is not safe because I can't do, I can't perform my practices. I can't maintain my sterile fields. This is an accreditation violation. This is going to impact SSI rates. This is a collapse. And so that also helps buy in as you work through this process to show your administrators, okay, this is a safety issue that's going to cost you down the line. It's not, I like this, I like that. And therefore the results and the changes you make are going to be impactful even in five to seven years. Excellent, excellent. So one of the things you mentioned towards the end of that response was about cost. And do you guys have an estimate of how much the cost of the pre-construction simulations and all that, right? And so it's not just the work itself, but it's also the cost of all those clinicians to be at mm -hmm. the simulated bedsides. Yeah, so we estimate that hospital design testing costs about $2 million and that we saved upwards of 80 million in cost avoidance so, and cost savings. And so all of that's here, covered here in the construction mm -hmm. cost itself. Yeah, it's covered under the construction and operational budget. <laughs> So if you're talking about, so it's eight, I don't know, Pavin, can you guys hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for the cl clinicians times, it's going to be about each, you know, each area being willing to carve out and send their people. So, and ultimately it's not a huge number of hours over the course of the year just for simulation, but if they are going to all the design meetings and then attending this as well. So um, we had to get, to get some buy-in there, but outside of that, just for, the cardboard and renting the warehouse and putting up everything there. Uh, it was actually pretty under, it was well under $2 million, but man, some of the changes we made, we completely redesigned and blew up a lot of our spaces schematically in terms of how array of rooms were going to be arranged and what type of adjacencies there would be. And then within the rooms themselves made some pretty substantial changes. So just our operating rooms alone, what we did with the ORs, which is, ultimately a money maker for institutions too was was substantial that in and of itself would have been more than enough savings um, in, in terms of fiscal return on investment um, so yeah you've got to convince them that there's going to be some buy-in but my goodness the the changes were are, are substantial it is very difficult to just look at paper and or just walk through a space and figure out what you're going to need to do um, you know the great the, one of the important properties of safety is that it's emergent and so without active work in a space you're not going to really be able to tease out what the safety issues are so staring at a room is 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 just an inadequate way or insufficient way in my opinion to really tease out what those latent conditions are going to be excellent thank you thank you so much um 
So I don't see any further questions. Um, so I wanted to say again, thank you to both of you for presenting your great work here and hearing about the whole process as well as the debriefing tool. Um, and also a reminder to all of our attendees um, that the IPSS Spring Symposium is coming up on May 19th from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, will be held virtually, focusing on simulation transforming safety, so please register. And also in the next couple days, uh, the IPSS V2021 call for papers, uh, for research, for presentations on your research, innovations, workshops, will be coming out. IPSS V2021 will be held again virtually, and it will be in September of this year. I'm looking forward to a spectacular program uh, over a Friday, Saturday, Sunday time period. And, uh, and your presentation may be the next award winner um, as uh, we see today with Nora and Karen's great work. Thank you for having us. It was great to be here. Karen, any other closing thoughts? Uh, no, I just want to thank you all for uh, inviting us. And we're looking forward to the virtual symposium in May as well. And uh, we will be in attendance listening. Excellent. I think that the workshop will be a great place for discussion and um, furthering, further, further thinking about the many of the concepts that you brought up, you guys brought up today. So thank you very much, everybody.